So this is our uh, our wildlife biologist report that we've put together for this year. Uh, so I'm Fox Creighton, and uh, some of my interests that I have are within amphibians, specifically in salamanders. Uh, however, I do really enjoy birds and mammals. Uh, like Calder was saying, I have my bachelor's of science in biology and a minor in environmental science. Um, and I am Maggie. Uh, this is my second summer with uh, Twilt. And uh, some of my interests are uh, plants mainly. Um, and I'm also interested in mammals as well as reptiles and amphibians. And as Calder, as Calder mentioned, um, I took the Fish and Wildlife Technician program at Fleming College. So we did want to mention, uh, we do have a bat slash gripper will walk um, on Thursday, July 20, uh, 21st. It'll be, the location will be at um, La Rose Bay Road and uh, County Road 3. At, uh, we'll be starting at 9 and it typically takes two hours, so it'll be ending around 11. So it would be fun if you, and if any of you guys can come out, uh, maybe learn some more about bats and whippoorwills and maybe get to hear their calls. So our outline, what we're gonna be covering today is we're gonna quickly go over what uh, Kozik is. Uh, we're gonna be going, talking about uh, the birds that we've been monitoring on Twilt's properties. And we'll be talking, uh, I'll have a brief little talk about one with salamanders in Eastern Ontario. And Maggie will then cover uh, bats in Ontario while then talking about some of the invasive species that uh, we've encountered on Twilt's properties. So, uh, so COSIC is, is a, uh, so it stands for the Committee, uh, Committee of Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. So they typically meet twice a year just to talk and determine what species in Canada are at risk of extinction. So their typically members would include um, wild, like wild, uh, wildlife biology experts from the government, some non-government organizations, and even some private organizations. Uh, so they, how it works, they have like a chaired committee um, that have each kind of group has so many seats. So, but that's not really the more important part here. The more important part is, is understanding uh, how the statuses work. So the statuses work of kind of like a, more, kind of like a chain. So starting with extinction is the species no longer doesn't, no longer exists anymore. And then as, as it goes down, it kind of, uh, because of extirpated, which means it just no longer exists within a region. So this region would be maybe Canada. Uh, then there's endangered, which is what is likely to be being faced of uh, extinction or extirpated. Uh, then there's endangered, which is likely to become, so it's sorry, threatened, that's likely to become endangered if nothing is done to prevent uh, the course of action. And then there's species of concern, which is just saying that human activities or maybe natural events are affecting the species, as well as there's uh, spe uh, not of concern, which is just species that are not of their concern currently. So uh, bird monitoring on with Twilt. Uh, so we've been focusing on three main birds. Uh, we've been working uh, with, with bobolinks, uh, eastern meadowlarks, and eastern whippoorwills. So we'll go quickly over about what bobolinks look like and some of their behaviors. So bobolinks are approximately 10 to 20 centimeters in length, which is about five to nine inches that when they're adults. Now, when, uh, the, when males are in breeding, they typically have a black front face wings and black feathered tails. Then they have like a white stripe down the back and they have a light yellow like back of like their head. Now, females and non-breeding males, whether if they're uh, they typically look, uh, they have more yellow, they have yellow across their chest. Uh, they have like, they, their neck and wings and abdomen have to be yellow. They still have that black stripes down their wings. And, but they do have a little bit of a brown strip on their crown, which is just the spot right, uh, right before their beak that heads back to the back of their head. So some of the range of the bobble links. Uh, so there's they kind of classified in three different parts. Where the breeding range is in uh, was in northern United States and southern Canada. Except there's not really seen as much in BC. However, you could still see them. Uh, they migrate throughout uh, the southeast United States as well as down right through the Caribbean, and the, and uh, right through 
uh, the north end of South uh, America. And they end up for the non-breeding season down in like Bolivia, uh, Bolivia down from Southwest Brazil and Paraguay. Uh, and so their habitats they actually prefer is, uh, they prefer like a mixture of grasslands. Uh, so this could be seen as a, uh, some hay fields or meadows. Uh, so bobolinks are normally found uh, nesting on the ground and down in dense grass where they're able to build up their nests. So in, in the summer uh, up in Southern Ontario, we do find them in, um, sorry, we do find them in like tall grass and hay fields and even in some meadows. And then in, when they go down south to winter, uh, they're normally found in grassland marshes and even in crop fields down south. So some of the bobolinks' behaviors and diets. Uh, so bobolinks do flock together uh, during not during the breeding season. So when they so they when they travel down south, they'll be flocking. They'll be socially flocks. Uh, however, when it becomes breeding season, they are more competitive for territory, and they will they will normally sing to uh, mark off what they what they say is their territory. Uh, so typically, some of the behaviors that we have seen and uh, is bobolinks will fly around uh, hay fields and nest or their nesting area uh, before landing right down into into the into the uh, into the uh, into their nest area. Uh, so that's kind of one way we can kind of see them before they head down into the tall uh, hay. Uh, normally, their incubation period, they sit on the eggs, is about 10 to 15 days, and then their nesting period is about 11. So when they decide, when they start to fledge around um, like the mid-July, uh, you, would, you would know that they'd be having their eggs closer to the mid to end June. Uh, their main diet is on insects uh, and arachnids, and they will have seeds. So currently the bobolinks coex status is, uh, they're currently threatened. So bobolinks uh, are considered threatened um, in, in Canada. Um, so the reason why they're, we can, uh, they have been kind of heading towards a threatened status or even more is because they're actually considered a pest in South America uh, because they've, they have known they be uh, actively eating the gra some grain crops. Uh, another reason why they've been been having troubles is during uh, their breeding season is actually right in the time of where we like to cut our like we like to cultivate hay. So because of this, this could affect the, the hatchlings, the egg, or even uh, before they get to fledge. So because of that, that's another reason why they've become they've been having more difficulties. Uh, so the modern hay practices, so having a shorter turnover within within their seasons, so just seeds that are able to produce more quickly, uh, have been affecting the quality of habitats because it's been much more harder for them to stay in one spot longer. So what we've been doing on with Twilt is uh, we've been the objective behind our monitoring was is to protect uh, nesting bobolink populations on Twilt property properties while while confirming their presence. So we are mainly doing that by spending time along edging of nesting areas to physically see the bird. We are actively watching for their behaviors with, um, within many birds that might be in the area. And we are also listening for their calls. So Eastern meadowlarks. So Eastern meadowlarks are, uh, are very uh, unique looking bird. Uh, they have a black V across their chest. Uh, they also have yellow down the like da around the black V, their neck and their abdomen. So on on the back side of eastern meadowlarks is actually a mixture of brown, black, and white. Uh, it's kind of like spotted in, and then so they typically get about like twenty to twenty five centimeters, which is about seven to ten inches. And their main diet is, they, they do have mainly insects. However, it, it wouldn't be uncommon to see them eating any wild fruits or even any grain seeds as well. So the Eastern Meadowlarks uh, range is, uh, so they're in Southern Ontario and Quebec. 
uh, in even the Northeast of the United States during their breeding season. And however, all year, they're typically seen within like the central, the Southeast United States to Central America and even Northern, uh, Northern uh, South America, like Colombia and Venezuela. Uh, and their habit so typically the habitats are quite similar to bobbling, so they'll be fine in pastures, hay fields, and they can even they have been seen in airports as well, but I think that would not be a great place for them to hang out. So some of the metal arcs behaviors. So uh, so during the spring, metal arcs are very vocal and they like and it's been seen that singing has been, been possibly linked to their establishing territory. Uh, so normally once a group have, so male and female have kind of found a territory, they typically return to the same spot every year. Um, so, but, so when, yeah, when they return, another thing that's always good to note when, like when trying to look out for Eastern meadowlarks is uh, if you actually scare the female off their nest, you can actually cause them to abandon their incubation. Uh, so it's so you always want to be careful when you're looking for them, and especially during their breeding season, because you don't want to force them off of their eggs. So the eastern the eastern meadowlarks co uh, coex status currently is, is threatened as well, uh, and it's from similar reasons of the bobbling. However, theirs is mainly from like development of development of their of lands like uh meadows and in different areas uh they've also seen they've also been affected by the change in farming practices even the overgrazing of livestock and they've also because they eat insects um it is it's been seen they've been affected by even pesticides so when insects are obviously still hanging around the uh pesticides even though they sprayed the crops well the the eastern meadowlarks will still eat the insects that have been affected and they'll be affected almost down the chain from the original point. So we've been, the Eastern Meadowlark monitoring has been done actually very similar to monitoring uh, bobolinks where we, uh, we spend time along the edge of nesting areas. They can see them, we watch for their behaviors and we listen for their calls. Unfortunately, I have not gotten to see Eastern Meadowlark yet, but there's still time. So our third bird that we have that we've been monitoring with twelve the summer is the eastern uh, the eastern whippoorwill. So the eastern whippoorwill is uh, about twenty to twenty five centimeters. It's a little bigger than a little bigger than a robin. They have a they describe them. They have like a white. They have kind of a white bib with like a, a grayish black with mixed in with brown that that camouflage them. They still kind of like a leaf litter or even some bark. Uh, so they are a nocturnal bird, so they do all their all their kind of moving around and foraging during the night. Uh, they're actually exclusively on insects. So the way they kind of uh, go and capture their food is uh, they'll be flying around during the night, especially during the full moons between um, about mid June to. Um, uh, until beginning of August, the remain active times up here, uh, and they'll be foraging insects in in the air. Uh, they 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 also use their calls uh, to maintain and establish their territory, <clears throat> and it has also been seen for them to uh, to mimic to make uh, calls that make them sound injured to can, so they can lead predators away from their nesting area. So they're not putting their young because they are all they they're also another ground nesting bird, just like the other, uh, just like the bobolink and the eastern meadowlark. So the range that they uh, that they've been seen. So during their breeding time, they're seen in like the uh, southeastern uh, southeastern uh, Ontario and Quebec. Sorry, so yeah, southeastern Canada. So that's like Ontario, Quebec, uh, Nova Scotia and parts of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, but during the non-breeding times, they're around, they're around the Gulf of Mexico, uh, so as well as the Central America. And 
and the southern coast of uh, the United States as well. <clears throat> so their habitats are uh, are really uh, interesting. So they so they nest within the forest. Uh, with they like to have little underbrush, so they're able to fly throughout their their nesting area as well. They like to have that mix, like so they like the open areas, fields, wetlands where they're able to forage for insects, but then they come for cover within the forests where they're able to hide down for the day and be able to build and stay at their nest. So the whippoorwill currently is coic status. So they're also another th threatened bird here in Canada. <clears throat> so mainly their habitats have been affected. Um, it's mainly habitat lost and so, <clears throat> sorry uh so fields become uh so over time uh for like forest habitats that surround fields and wetlands can become like thick vegetation uh so that's one of the reasons why they have been a decrease uh there's definitely been uh effect by car mortality rates because of um they typically fly around in um uh, in open areas, which happen to be where roads are as well. So they've are, they do see quite a bit of car mortalities, unfortunately. Now, another thing that really affects them are the pesticides from the food that they consume. So because they are in, because they only eat insects, they are just like the Eastern meadowlarks affected by spraying a pesticide on crops. Now, another reason why they're threaded is uh, predators because they're So because they are, a uh, so they're also affected by predators like cats. Because they are a ground nesting bird, uh, they are often, they're more vulnerable than birds that have uh, nests far, like in trees. So it's been seen in the United States because they've been recording this for a little bit now, uh, that they've seen a like 2% decline a year in their population since the 60s. So transitioning from birds to salamanders. So, so, uh, so uh, the way uh, salamanders are kind of put together uh, is um, they are they are an, an amphibian, and then the ones that we'll be talking about today are the lungless salamanders. So the the lungless salamanders that can be found in Longest salamanders that can be found within Eastern Ontario are mainly the, the spotted salamander, which we have down here in the bottom right photo that we've actually found on one of Twilt's properties. We have the Northern Two Line Salamander, it, which we have here. Again, we found it on one of Twilt's properties. And then we have the Eastern Redback, the Blue Spotted Salamander, and then the Four Toed sal Salamander. And they do have four toes. So the habitats uh, salamanders typically uh, like to find themselves in is actually dependent on what stage of development they are currently in. So the eggs and larvae, larval, typically need uh, more shallow bodies of water like vertical pools, wetlands, uh, ponds. And uh, however, when they, when they become more of an adult, they like more of like a, a mixed forest or indigenous uh, or a broadly forest um, and they've typically like to find them they hang out during the day under uh, fallen decaying trees or they hide under rocks typically during a during the well while it's wet and rained or after a fresh rain you might actually be able to find salamanders crawling on the leaf litter in that kind of transition like zone uh, between habitats uh, so their adults actually forage on for insects on the leaf litter so that's why you typically you can find them within within forests, uh, and they'll eat spiders, crickets, or almost most insects they can find on the, the forest floor. So the life the life cycle um, or salamanders are are similar to how frogs are. So they'll spend their early time uh, within aquatic habitats, and then they will spend most of their adult years on. Like terrestrial, so on on like land habitats. So they start off as eggs, then they become 
war uh, warble stage which at that time they'll be using gill buds to to breathe in the water uh and then from there they'll grow slowly they'll grow forearms and then hind legs and then they'll grow the, then to be juvenile which there'll be a transition state from when they're juvenile to an adult when they'll be spending most of their time on land so the, the adults actually the reason why they call lungless salamanders is because they actually breathe through the uh through their skin and with the and then with the help with the moisture in their environment however they do have a membrane in their mouth that also helps diffuse oxygen and trade carbon dioxide as well. So all the species that I have listed, uh, currently in Eastern Ontario, there is not one of them, are they're all considered not of concern. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still be mindful of salamanders. Uh, so the reason why we can actually monitor one with salamanders and still have a good reason to is they're actually a great uh, quality indicator species. So over time, if you collect data on them, uh, you can actually gain information about their surrounding environment. Uh, so you can tell by if the water has changed in any way or soil, and it's it's kind of an indirect uh, quality control based off of how the salamanders are reacting. All right, so um, I'm going to start talking about uh, bats to begin with. Um, so this is a species that we are trying to collect data on, on some of Twilt's properties. So um, I'm just going to give you a bit of a kind of introduction on bats and um, their status and uh, why they're important. Um, and then I'll get into uh, what we're actually, what we've actually been doing at Twilt over the summer. Um, so there are uh, eight species of bats that are found in Ontario and four of those species are actually listed as species at risk uh, currently. Uh, so they are the tricolored bat, the little brown bat, the northern long-eared bat, and the eastern small-footed bat. Um, and bats are a very critical part of the ecosystem and food chains. Uh, they're very efficient predators. Um, so the average bat can actually consume between 600 and 1,000 mosquitoes or insects per hour. So they're ext extremely beneficial in uh, insect and pest management. Um, some of the habitat which bats uh, prefer are forests. So they, they require the forests and forest edges for roost habitat. So they will roost in uh, cavities in tree trunks, um, woodpecker holes, and they'll roost underneath some like loose or cracked bark. And they require uh, close proximity to water bodies um, or open areas for foraging. Uh, usually there are a lot more uh, insects and bugs that are around water bodies and wetlands. Um, so they prefer to be close to those areas. And there are actually both non-migratory species and migratory species in Ontario. So uh, we have we have three migra migratory species. Uh, so those are the Eastern red bat, the silver haired bat and the hoary bat, which they will actually uh, migrate down to uh, Southern states, uh, South America, that area where they uh, can still um, find insects uh, and appropriate habitat to support them. And the non-migratory species um, they'll stay here and hibernate in caves uh, for the winter. And um, because of this, they're actually susceptible to a fungus that's that causes white nose syndrome, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, they're threatened. So I'll get into that a little bit more uh, as we go along. So some of the main threats to bats right now are uh, white nose syndrome is a very, um, one of the biggest threats currently, um, and habitat loss as well. So with the clearing of forests, uh, urbanization and development, uh, they're losing a little bit of habitat. And then also exposure to pesticides. So similar uh, to what Fox uh, was talking about with the birds who eat insects, um, the insects that are exposed to the pesticides um, 
they carry the pesticides in them and then uh, when the bats eat them, eat the insects, it, uh, it bioaccumulates in the tissues. Um, so that can cause uh, issues for the bats as well. And also um, some other threats to bats are things like wind turbines. Um, there is a little bit of mortality, bat mortality from wind turbines, especially with the migrating bats. Um, another threat is uh, climate change. Um, it's obviously threatens a lot of species, but um, bats in particular, the changing of the seasons, um, it could influence in futures, it could influence their length of hibernations and things like that. Um, and on top of all of these, the female uh, bats, they only give birth to one pup each year. So that makes it very difficult for the populations to rebound from any kind of substantial declines, like for example, from white nose syndrome, it's just very difficult uh, for the populations to come back from that. And so specifically on white nose syndrome, so it's called, it's caused by a fungus uh, called Pseudogymnoascus destructens. Um, the last part of the name is uh, pretty descriptive on uh, what you can expect from uh, the fungus, actually. It's uh, believed to be brought to North America, to North America from Europe by um, people exploring caves. So they would have picked up the fungus on their equipment and gear, and then they would have traveled uh, over to, to North America and gone into uh, some caves here and explored. Um, and then that fungus would have been transferred from their equipment uh, into these caves where it's the perfect conditions for the fungus to thrive. So they like those dark, cool, humid conditions where they can just uh, spread and thrive. And um, so when bats are hibernating, the fungus will grow on their muzzle, their ears, and their wings and it will um, ingest some of their tissues actually. So it causes uh, some water loss of their tissues. And then um, it results in the bats waking up early from hibernation. And so when they wake up early, they don't have the appropriate food sources. Uh, it's still too cold for them. So it, it usually results in the bats needing to use up a lot of their fat reserves. Uh, so, unfortunately, the bats will usually die from starvation or dehydration, um, and the mortality rate of infected hibernacula is actually 80 to 100 percent. And um, the bats who survive a winter in an infected hibernacula who are lucky enough, they don't have any immunity against the fungus for future years. So in future years, they could get the fungus um, and die as a result. And so right now, there, some researchers are testing different treatments, but currently there aren't any. So preventing the spread is very critical at this stage until uh, treatments become available. Um, and so bats could actually have a relatively long life um, if it weren't for white nose syndrome. Um, there's an example of a bat um, being tagged and tracked in uh, southeastern Ontario, a little brown bat. And uh, this is prior to uh, the introduction of white nose syndrome. And it lived for a record of 31 years. Um, but now, unfortunately, with the introduction of the fungus, which causes the white nose syndrome, uh, the bat populations are suffering quite a bit. So at Tewilt, currently we have uh, four bat monitors set up on uh, on our on four prop four different properties. So we're collecting data on the presence of bats um, and what species of bats are on the properties. So we're using bat monitors, which we have uh, installed on trees, usually overlooking a wetland or a, an area that we uh, consider to be perfect foraging habitat for them. So the bat monitors are able to convert the ultrasonic echolocation calls that normally we wouldn't be able to hear. 
and it converts them into frequencies that are audible to us. Uh, and then each species can then be identified by their distinct calls. Um, so uh, after the season's done, we'll send off the data and hopefully get some really good results back. Um, obviously, we hope to, we always hope to have um, species at risk uh, observations on the properties. Uh, so we'll, uh, it'll be very interesting to see uh, which properties the bats are present on and which, and which species. Um, and again, uh, as Fox mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, um, if you want to learn a little bit more about bats and whippoorwills, uh, we're, ho we're hosting a walk at uh, the Ross property. Um, so meeting at the Rose Bay Road and County Road 3 at uh, 9 p.m. on Thursday. Um, and so next I'm going to talk about some invasive species that we uh, have been have encountered on Twilt properties and have been controlling uh, so far this summer. So um, first of all, for anyone uh, who might not um, know what an invasive species is, they're a plant, insect, animal, or pathogen that's been introdu introduced to an area where it is not native to. And so it can arrive through a variety of different pathways. Many of them are uh, human influenced. Um, so for example, some species of plants uh, had been planted intentionally prior to the, um, the invasive uh, tendencies being known. Um, so for uh, ornamental purposes or uh, herbal or herbal gardens. Um, and then the plants have escaped and uh, uh, invaded the forest uh, ecosystems. Um, and then some species can have actually hitchhiked uh, here from transportation of vehicles, uh, movement of firewood, and uh, just picking up you know, seeds and plant materials on boots and equipment and that kind of thing. Um, so invasive species, they actually don't have any natural predators here. So this can lead to them spreading quite aggressively and taking over habitats, uh, which then usually end up displacing our native species. So a lot of wildlife species tend to avoid uh, foraging on uh, invasive species, unfortunately. So there isn't a lot of uh, natural control measures uh, available. So when they uh, become established, they can cause significant ecological uh, damage to the environment by um, crowding out other species and um, yeah, making it, uh, making changing the forest ecosystems and uh, the environment as a whole. Um, so the next couple of slides, I'll go over some examples of some common invasive species that we have here in this region. So on this slide, we have common reed, uh, common buckthorn and the LDD moth in its caterpillar form. Um, and next we have dog strangling vine, wild parsnip and garlic mustard. Um, so the list is much larger than this of invasive species and, and it's always growing. Um, but for this, for the purposes of this presentation, um, I'll be focusing on talking more about dog strangling vine, wild parsnip, and garlic mustard, uh, as these three species are the ones that we've come across most on uh, Twilt's properties, and we've actively been managing these species. So uh, the control methods are very species specific. Uh, at Tewilt, we primarily use uh, manual control, such as digging or pulling out plants and collecting seed pods. Uh, so um, we've primarily focused on wild parsnip, garlic mustard, and dog strangling vine over the summer. So uh, garlic mustard is native to Europe. It was introduced to North America during the mid 1800s as an edible herb. Uh, it has a strong garlic smell and a similar taste. And it's, uh, it escaped gardens and has become one of Ontario's most aggressive for forest invaders. 
uh, the seeds drop close to the parent plants. Uh, so they're, they're spread more frequently by the seeds, uh, wildlife and pets picking up the seeds and traveling and spreading uh, the, the seeds, uh, which will establish new populations elsewhere. Um, and also uh, us humans accidentally walking through an area that might have seeds, picking them up in our boots and then uh, distributing them elsewhere. So the ID features for garlic mustard, the first year they grow as a basal rosette of leaves uh, near the ground of green uh, kidney shaped leaves with uh, sort of wavy or scalloped edges. Uh, the second year uh, is when they flower. They'll grow um, over a meter high and they have triangular sharply toothed leaves that are arranged uh, alternately along the stem. They produce uh, white small flowers in the second year. And then the seed pods are a long, narrow, slender uh, pod that splits open to release many seeds. Uh, so here are a few pictures of that illustrate the ID features. So we have the, uh, the basal rosette of small leaves down near the ground, and then the second year plant with the flowers and the sharply uh, toothed leaves. And then uh, the third picture is um, illustrating the seed pods. So the impacts of garlic mustard, it uh, displaces native wildflowers, native wildflowers like trilliums, uh, trout lilies, um, a lot of the uh, native uh, forest uh, flowers that usually spring ephemerals that will grow uh, early on in the spring, uh, which is the similar time that garlic mustard grows. Um, and they are a threat to Ontario's species at risk plants um, because they can just uh, take over an environment and um, just completely crowd out any other plants. They're also um, what's called allelopathic. So they will produce chemicals in the roots uh, that prevent other plants uh, from growing nearby. So they'll distribute the chemicals into uh, the soils and which will affect uh, fungi that's uh, beneficial to other plant species. Uh, they'll, um, yeah, so they'll interfere with the growth of fungi in the soil. Uh, these, the fungi uh, bring nutrients um, and water to roots of the other plants. Uh, so when this fungi is uh, affected by uh, the garlic mustard, um, it makes it difficult for other small plants and trees to grow nearby. It also um, alters the decomposition cycle. So garlic mustard leaves are uh, very high in nutrient content. And when, when the plants die, they basically speed up the, de the decomposition cycle of all the leaf litter uh, that's uh, nearby on the forest floor. Um, so typically it ends up being the forest floor is pretty bare with just soil and um, which is uh, our forests don't uh, thrive in those kinds of environments. Uh, forests typically need the slow decomposition of the, the leaves um, on the forest floor. Um, so control methods are um, a little bit difficult um, in the sense that it requires a long-term management strategy because the seeds can remain viable in the soil for many years. So at Tewilt, we've been uh, hand pulling the plants um, and before they go to, go to seed is um, one of the best control measures um, to uh, help prevent the spread of garlic mustard. Uh, so when we're pulling the plants, uh, we always have to be careful to remove the entire uh, garlic mustard root system. Um, if it's if the roots break when they're pulled, um, it can result in re-sprouting of the plants. So, and then we dispose of the 
the garlic mustard plants in uh, black garbage bags. And then we leave them for several weeks uh, to solarize. And um, uh, yeah, we leave them and then until they're ready to be uh, uh, disposed of at a dump. Um, and so the garlic mustard control that we did over the summer uh, was on a, a property where it was, the populations were very, very spread out. And this was likely um, as a result of a lot of deer on the property, uh, picking up the plants and, or picking up the plant uh, seeds and distributing them elsewhere. So the garlic mustard was kind of uh, spread out across the whole property basically in small patches. Um, and so we've collected uh, several garbage bags of garlic mustard uh, by just hand pulling the plants. It's a fairly fairly easy control uh, method, but as I said, it does require um, a lot of patience um, and many years of pulling the plants. Uh, the next plant uh, that I'll talk about is dog strangling vine. It's native to Europe and was introduced to the northeastern United States in the 1800s um, to be used as an ornamental plant in gardens. And it's been spreading very rapidly in southern and central Ontario so far. Um, it reproduces by both seed and the root fragments. And each, uh, each, or sorry, the dog strangling vine can produce 28,000 seeds per square meter. It's a member of the milkweed family and it has similar seeds uh, with the kind of tufts of hair um, that are, that make it easily spread by the wind. Some ID features, uh, the plants can grow to two meters in height with a stem that climbs similar to a vine. So it'll grow upright until it can't stand its weight anymore. And then it'll start, it'll flop over and start twining and wrapping itself around other trees, other plants. <coughs> it has um, smooth green leaves that are arranged opposite on the stem. Uh, they are oval in shape with a rounded base and are pointed at the top. <coughs> they have uh, small pinkish flowers with, <coughs> with five petals that are arranged in clusters of five to 20 and slender bean-shaped seed pods that turn from a light green uh, to a brown color at maturity. Um, so here are some photo, some ID photos. Um, so it has those opposite leaves, which are pointed. And the second picture is a really good picture that shows its uh, growth patterns where it will wrap itself right around trees as a vine. And it has those very long slender seed pods. Uh, with the pink with the pink flowers that are uh, star shaped. So some of the impacts of dog strangling vine, um, it creates dense monoculture stands that crowd out native plants and young trees. Um, again, similar to, to garlic mustard, it's able to produce and release chemicals into the soil that discourage other plants from growing nearby. It uh, threatens rare ecosystems, um, including tall grass prairies, alvars, and oak savannas and oak woodlands. Um, it likes to grow in those similar open habitats. Um, it does best in sun uh, conditions, but it can um, also tolerate some shade as well. But uh, these uh, rare ecosystems are uh, definitely threatened by dog strangling vine. Um, and then it also alters habitats of species at risk, grassland birds uh, like bobolinks and meadowlarks and savanna sparrows uh, because it similarly can grow and thrive in those habitats where those birds 
uh, prefer. Um, and it also impacts uh, the monarch butterfly. So as I mentioned before, it is in the milkweed family um, and it grows in similar habitat to milk to the common milkweed, uh, which is the monarch butterfly's host plant. Um, so because of these similarities to milkweed, the butterflies uh, can often mistakenly lay eggs on the dog strangling vine. And then the monarch larvae don't have a suitable food source. They, they need the, the milkweed itself as their, suit, as their food source. Uh, so when they are mistakenly, uh, when the eggs are mistakenly laid on the dog strangling vine, um, the larvae aren't able to survive. And the monarch is listed as special concern. So uh, this could threaten them further, uh, it can contri could contribute to further declines. Um, so dog strangling vine control is, it's eradication is very difficult. And again, it requires a long-term management strategy. So digging up the plants is a viable control measure. Um, however, the entire root system needs to be removed to prevent re-sprouting. Uh, the plants can very easily re-sprout from the root fragments. Uh, and seed pods can be collected in late summer to early fall. Uh, this will help prevent populations from growing, but it's not necessarily a a complete eradication method. Um, and so, and then the all plants, all plant parts uh, dispose, uh, should be disposed of in black garbage bags and left to solarize. Um, so we have done a little bit of seed collect, seed pod collecting on Tuolt properties uh, where we found a uh, dog strangling vine. Uh, and then the last one I'll talk about is wild parsnip. Um, so it's a member of the carrot and the parsley family native to Europe and Asia. It's believed to be brought to North America by European settlers who grew it for its edible root. It spreads very quickly in disturbed areas such as roadsides, abandoned yards, open fields and meadows and dumps. And it's also uh, the species um, most, uh, most people know are very familiar of it now. It grows, on, grows very commonly on roadsides and it's the species where the sap uh, can actually react with the sunlight uh, to cause rashes and burns on skin. Uh, it can grow up to one and a half meters tall um, and it has those characteristic yellow uh, umbel of flowers. Uh, its leaflets are sharply toothed and often mitten shaped. Uh, and similar to garlic mustard, the first year plants grow as the basil rosette of just the leaflets. And then the plant will flower in its second year of growth. So uh, some of the impacts, it affects uh, human health uh, with the sap uh, can potentially react with the sunlight uh, to cause blisters on exposed skin. Uh, it impacts biodiversity by outcompeting net native vegetation and can impact pollinators. It grows uh, in the similar uh, habitats as the plants uh, which native pollinators rely on, so it can displace those, uh, those native species. And it can also decrease the quality of agricultural forest crops. Um, so we did a little bit of uh, wild parsnip control. Um, it's definitely not a species that uh, should be controlled uh, without uh, proper uh, equipment and uh, PPE um, and without the proper training. So we went out on one of our properties um, where there is a very large population of wild parsnip. Um, and we went out with uh, a couple member, a couple uh, people from uh, the Ontario Land Trust Alliance who uh, helped us out and uh, taught us how to uh, remove the plants. So uh, we were suited up in uh, safety glasses and 
uh, the white Tyvek suits and gloves. And uh, we went out on a day that was a couple of days that were fairly overcast. So we weren't overly concerned uh, about the sunlight uh, reacting with the with the sap. Um, and we were uh, had enough PPE that uh, that wasn't a, a concern. Um, and so uh, we we focused on one area of the field where uh, the plants were not as sparse, a little bit spread out. And so um, I wish we had a good, we didn't get a chance to get a good picture of it, but we had uh, the field, if you look at it now, if you look at where we controlled, um, it looks like it's drastically different from the part of the, the field um, where we weren't able to control. So we definitely made a, a little bit of a dent in the population to um, help it to help prevent it from spreading any further. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the species identification apps that we've used uh, over the summer with Twilt. Um, so I use iNaturalist a lot. Uh, it's a really great app for um, finding out uh, species. Uh, you can take a picture of plants, wildlife, birds, anything, and the app will give you suggestions on what it thinks it is. And then you can make that observation and then other people can um, confirm your identification or can actually tell you what it is if you're unsure about it. And then uh, we use Seek a lot. Uh, it's made by iNaturalist as well. Um, and uh, you can take a work similarly. It takes a picture of the plant or of fungi, insects, anything, and it'll give you uh, recommendations on what species it is. And so these two apps are really great for identifying um, any kind of species, plants, wildlife, birds, everything. Uh, and it can help identify uh, invasive species as well. Uh, so which leads me to the next app, which is uh, very helpful. Uh, it's called EdMaps Ontario. Uh, it's focused on invasive species. So you can make invasive species observations and it will actually map out where the invasive species are. So you're contributing that data um, to uh, mapping projects uh, to help uh, learn more about the species and where it's distributed. And then some bird apps that we've used um, over the summer, we've mainly used Merlin. Uh, it's a really great app. You can actually make recordings of uh, calls that you're hearing and the app will tell you um, what it thinks is calling, what, kind, what species of bird is calling. And then eBird is also a good app to uh, contribute to data about species observations and species abundance and what habitat uh, birds are uh, frequenting. And then our last few slides, our last few slides, um, we just wanted to show a few photos of some fun finds that we've had uh, throughout the summer. So um, on this slide, we've got a, a nice little spider up here. who can hardly see him. He's very camouflaged in with the yellow flower there. Um, we have ghost pipe here and a, a really great picture that Fox got of a barred owl. Um, we have a luna moth and a blanding's turtle as well. Uh, and then um, we have a gray rat snake and um, the little virgin tiger moth. Yeah, yeah. The little virgin tiger moth. Uh, and then we just have a really good photo of the falls at Glen Elb. And then uh, a nice little American toad in the top corner there. Um, and down here we have a, a little uh, fawn deer that we saw that we 
uh, was kind of hidden in some uh, some grasses on a, that we were uh, just walking by and barely even noticed him. He was uh, tucked in there, hidden away. Um, and then a blue heron up here. And just some nice uh, scenery photos as well. And then uh, that's everything now. Uh, we wanted to open it up to some questions. Uh, if anyone would like to ask anything about our presentation or about us um, and our summer, uh, feel free.